Okay, well, good morning. My name is uh, Jauke Kamp. I work mm -hmm. at uh, Wageningen UR, the same uh, institute as where uh, Tom Dweck is uh, working. I've been working there already for 70 years, so quite some time. Uh, and in the past, I did a lot of uh, research on, uh, on uh, energy saving and uh, dehumidification, which I'm going to tell something about uh, what is now the current state of the art and uh, what is the future uh, perspective in this, uh, in this field. Um, currently, I'm more working on international products uh, in, well, in New Zealand, in the Middle East, I'm a lot. So it's all on water saving more than on uh, energy saving in, that, uh, in those regions. But that's also interesting because some of the technologies we have been studying in the past can also be applied in, well, typical uh, climates like you have in Saudi Arabia where it's of course very warm, but then still some of these technologies can be applied there. So it's very nice to see how you can adapt technologies to a specific location and that's what we are trying to do a lot, uh, not only for the, in the Middle East, but also indeed for uh, New Zealand and other areas in the world. So it's. Uh, it's nice to uh, to work with all these models we sh we have been uh, developing and well to see them um, to be realized in in practice and then also to test if the models or the assumptions we made are indeed true in these uh, these countries. So that's uh, what we are working on a lot. But here I will talk about energy saving since it's cold here, so we, we need more energy saving than uh, water saving or uh, cooling uh, demand. So that's uh, what my talk is going to be about. Well, the background, um, as you know, most greenhouses in Holland, but also here in Norway, still have only a single glass uh, covering, which tends to uh, well lose a lot of heat, of course, when you are not applying thermal screens or other, other measures to, uh, to lower your energy use. So there's a big demand to increase the energy or the insulation properties of a greenhouse, and that's usually done by applying thermal screens. But then what you see is that you get a big issue on, uh, on humidity because if you are applying thermal screens or you're applying double cover, you get less condensation, which is normally occurring on your cover, and therefore your humidity is increasing and that causes, of course, disease and that sort of thing. So what you normally do is uh, for ventilation, for uh, uh, humidification control is... Ah, here it is. You slightly open the screen, for example, and thereby you get some air exchange between, between the air above the screen and below the screen. And since there's condensation on the covering, you get some uh, dehumidification in that respect. Or you as well open the, the window slightly, get some ventilation, and thereby remove some moisture from your greenhouse. Or you have a special screen where vapor can, uh, can be transported through. Uh, but and you can also apply some additional heating, so just raise the temperature a little, which also uh, stimulates that the uh, relative humidity goes down. But all these measures, of course, have energy uh, implications because uh, you need to uh, bring in more heat if you are ventilating. And also a big downside of this method is that you really get an uneven uh, climate in your greenhouse because normally when you apply these uh, openings in your screen, you see that in one side of the greenhouse the air tends to drop down and in the other side it goes up again and then you get really a big temperature distribution inside the greenhouse. So it's, it can be even, uh, we measured even five degrees temperature dif uh, differences between one side of the greenhouse and the other, which is of course not very beneficial for your crop production, even because it's always in the same place because you normally in the lower part of the greenhouse it drops and in the higher part it goes up. So it's always cold on one side and always warm on the other side and that's not very beneficial for your crop production. So an alternative needed to be found. And that's, uh, well, there are several ways to dehumidify if you want to dehumidify alternatively a side of ventilation. And that's with cooling. So if you apply a kind of cooling system like this where you have a cold surface and you get condensation on this surface and thereby you can get rid of your moisture. That's one way to do it. The other way is still using outside air but then distributing it more evenly. I will go into that method uh, a bit more. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Another alternative is uh, with a salt. We also looked at that so you can apply a hygroscopic salt. Uh, there are special PET systems over which you can um, let this very salty water flow and then the air goes through and then it dehumidifies the air and it warms up the air in the same time. Those systems have also been tested uh, but successfully it looks a bit like uh, um, oh, 
there's a picture in the next the slide, I think. But it's uh, it's 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 workable, but it's it's much it demands a much higher investment cost compared to these other systems. So that's why it's not really interesting to apply it in in greenhouses for the moment. So yeah, the majority of these systems now being implemented are these systems where you still are using outside air, but you distribute it much more evenly compared to uh, the normal classical system where you open the window or open the screen. And this system has not been applied a lot because also you need more investments. Of course, you need a heat pump in order to make this cold surface. And then you need to bring back this heat you took out with the heat pump. You need to bring it back. So it's a, it's a much more complex system compared to the uh, ventilation uh, system. So how does it work? Well, outside air is always drier than uh, inside air. Even when it's raining, a lot of people think that, that Outside air is much more humid than what the air inside the greenhouse, but if you look at the absolute humidity, you see that always the absolute humidity of your greenhouse air is always higher than outside because there's transpiration, and of course it's, it's always warmer in the greenhouse than, uh, than outside during these, uh, these, these periods. So always when you have an air exchange between outside and inside, you lose moisture, so you dehumidify the greenhouse. Um, well, and then with fans and ducts, you can distribute this outside air evenly in your greenhouse. And that's a big major advantage compared to the classical system, since yeah, you bring in this cold air, which you can also warm up uh, evenly in the greenhouse, so you don't get these cold spots and warm spots in your, in your greenhouse. Uh, well, you bring in this, this cold air, or if you warm it up for warm air, and you bring it in and it pushes out basically the humid air, because you get an overpressure, of course, in your greenhouse, but there's always sufficient amount of leaks in your greenhouse to get rid of this, uh, this humid air. What you can also do in order to increase your uh, energy saving is um, heat the incoming air with the outflowing air, but then you need a balanced system, of course, with a heat exchanger, and that's, uh, yeah, that's possible because it saves on energy, but it's also, of course, more it demands more investment because you need a heat exchanger and you need an additional ventilator to bring the air inside and to bring the air outside again. So that's also an, an additional cost, but for energy saving purposes, it's a good way to, to go. Um, yeah, as I said, some growers prefer to warm up this air coming in because, well, especially when it's really freezing outside, when it's minus 10 or something like that, and you bring in this minus 10 air through these ducts, it's rather cold, so you get a lot of condensation on these air ducts, so a lot of growers prefer to warm up this air before it, it enters your greenhouse. And that's, yeah, it's not really necessary because it comes in in the bottom, so it's, it remains below, so it's not harming your crop. And normally your heating system is also below, so it warms up this cold air and then it goes up. So, But yeah, for the same sense of uh, growers, it's, uh, they prefer to, uh, to heat it up. And also, they think, well, when it's minus 10, it really gives a tremendous uh, uh, difference in my uh, greenhouse. But when it's minus 10, then the absolute humidity of the outside air is very low. So you need a very little airflow coming in in order to dehumidify your greenhouse. So the amount of air coming in is, is limited. So it's, to my opinion, not always needed, but for the sense of the grower, it's, uh, it's often done. Well, how much do you need? Approximately five to six cubic meters per hour is sufficient. So that's in the hours when there's no sun and well, heating demand is, uh, is needed. Then this amount of, uh, of ventilation is already enough to keep your, yeah, your relative humidity around 80 to 90 percent uh, 90 in, the, in the greenhouse. Of course, when you're applying double glass or more thermal screens, it slightly increases because you get even less condensation on, on all kinds of parts. So you need more dehumidification using this system, so then you slightly need more uh, ventilation in that respect. <coughs> well, here drawing of uh, the, the uh, implementation in the greenhouse. So you have this air uh, distribution system, which is usually placed on the side of the uh, greenhouse, and attached to that are these sleeves by which you distribute the uh, air in the, in the greenhouse. Well, here you see a lot of these sleeves. In practice, every three gutters, one sleeve is sufficient enough to, uh, to distribute this air because it's not a lot of air to be distributed. So if you place one sleeve here and then another one here, that's, and then another one here approximately, that's enough already. But 
Here in this concept, we also use this system in order to heat the greenhouse, and then of course you need more of these uh, these leaves. So then in the greenhouse it looks a bit like this. Yeah, so the air comes in and then it goes up as it uh, uh, enters uh, the greenhouse, and then it pushes out the humid air which is above. And then, as I said before, you can also use this regain unit, eh? so this uh, this. Uh, Heat exchange unit, so this is the greenhouse in the blazer where we are using the system. So here's there's an air intake uh, inside, and then it flows but flows down towards this heat exchange unit, which you can see here. So here comes the, the inside air, and it goes out, and then the outside air goes through, and the, well, this is then basically the heat exchanger, which exchanges the heat before it goes in. So you warm up the incoming air with the outflowing air, which is humid and, and warm, so that saves on the, on energy then. And then it's uh, distributed through these uh, sleeves. <coughs> well, a lot of growers now are implementing this, uh, this system. So here, this is at a, a tomato grower which supplies the system. So you can see here, here there's a sleeve, and under the next gutter and the next gutter there's no sleeve anymore. So you don't need a lot of sleeves in order to, to do that. This is at a, at a tube uh, grower, so they now are growing tubes in multi-layer, so up to four layers now. And they also had a lot of issues with humidity, because for tulips the humidity should, be, should remain below 70%, otherwise you get some strange defects in the uh, tulip growing. So now they apply also these uh, air ducts, you can see them here, and also in the tables below. It's a fully automated uh, system. Uh, and that's there it's also working uh, very well and they are very satisfied because humidity was also always a very big issue in uh, tulip growing and now with this uh, system it's uh, it's not anymore so more and more growers are implementing this uh, this system and I think uh, well all new greenhouses will be equipped with uh, a system like this so um, well we always try to um, get more energy saving of course so that's why we have this uh, innovation and demonstration center in, in Blijswijk, where we are trying new concepts to show that more energy saving is, uh, is possible. So there we are trying to see, well, what more insulation we can uh, apply, reduce even the more the leakage of the greenhouse, because uh, greenhouses tend to leak quite a lot, although they look quite close, but they are effective or not. Of course, the temperature set point is a very big issue. Um, growers think that the certain temperature should be maintained in order to keep the production. But we try to lower the temperature and see if we can still have the same production level. That's also something we incorporate in our new uh, designs. Uh, move the season a little, so try to um, see if we can, uh, by slightly uh, starting later or starting earlier, see if uh, that's also a part of uh, how we can save on energy. And of course, the, uh, the, uh, the humidifying system, as I showed before. And then another thing we are looking into a lot is, uh, well, of course, the, uh, the uh, entrance of uh, natural uh, sunlight, because that comes for free. So you should utilize that as, as much as possible, of course. So if you bring in more natural light, you, of course, get higher temperature, and you don't need to um, provide it with the heating then. So that's also saving on, uh, on energy. So, yeah. Um, so we now looked, we now constructed one where the construction is much lighter, so less parts, which also saves on uh, on light, or, and uh, a better covering uh, material. So that concept has been incorporated in the in the Venlo Energy Greenhouse, which is uh, being constructed, in, which is now in operation for four, the fourth year already. There we have uh, very high insulation because we are using double glass uh, on top of this uh, this greenhouse. And it has a uh, transmission which is similar to normal glass because we, are, we have three AR coatings on it uh, and one low emission coating for the energy saving, of course. And then we get a hemispherical <coughs> transmission of 0.8, whereas with normal classical glass it's uh, 0.82. Uh, 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 so it's uh, uh, yeah, a lot. A lot uh, it's very transparent for a double, uh, double layer uh, glass. And then uh, we apply an additional screen, and we reduce the temperature. And of course, we are not using the minimum pipe temperature. So normally, growers 
tend to put their heating system to a certain temperature just to get an what they say an active climate so to get some air movement but uh, since we already have these sleeves and everything we are not uh, using the heating system in order to get this active climate so the, the heating system is not uh, used for that which also saves on energy of course and then of course we are using this uh, regain unit uh, for the dehumidification and we have some additional pipes so we can really uh, heat the greenhouse using very low temperature heat <coughs> and that also stimulates uh, energy uh, saving because well, when you can reduce the temperature of your heating system your boiler burns more efficiently or you can apply a heat pump to uh, heat your greenhouse which is also of course more uh, energy uh, efficient. Well coming back to these uh, covering materials so what you see here is uh, well, the spectrum, as we saw yesterday, quite a lot. And then you see here the uh, transmittance for, all the, for various uh, uh, materials. So the standard glass is the red line, which looks like uh, this. And then, well, the green line is the, uh, uh, the material we are using on the uh, Venlo Energy. So you see it's more or less the same transmission, especially in the, well, in the relevant part of the spectrum as uh, a standard glass. Of course, you see when you apply AR coating to standard glass, you get an even higher transmission. So that's also uh, being done a lot. But uh, um, yeah, for the comparison, we compare the standard glass with uh, with the uh, double layer with all these uh, modifications uh, to it. So here you see again uh, the figures. Yeah, the perpendicular is not really relevant because the sun is never perpendicular to the uh, uh, to the glass, of course. Only maybe a microsecond or something like that. So you should always look at the hemispherical uh, transmission. And you see that indeed for the uh, standard glass and this type of material, it's more or less the same. But if you look at uh, coated single glass, then it's uh, it's much higher than uh, uh, what we are using. So in this, uh, as I said, in this fellow energy greenhouse, we are now cultivating for the third year already. So we already had uh, three planting dates. Uh, we are always using Comet uh, crafted on Maxi4, and we start off with uh, 2.5 plants per square meter, and then after a while we let an extra storm come, so we end up with 3.8 storms per, uh, per square meter. And then here you see the results. So here is the production we have in the uh, Venlo uh, energy uh, greenhouse, and this is the reference uh, greenhouse. Well, what you see is that we uh, are achieving even a higher production in the Venlo energy compared to the reference greenhouse. So that's, uh, that's a good, uh, good thing. Uh, only here, of course, you see that the reference changed because here we, are, we were uh, using diffuse glass, and here we were, as a reference, also using then diffusing glass. And you see, well, that the application of diffuse glass has a tremendous effect on your reference case. And uh, it did not have a big effect on the uh, Venlo energy because we applied also additional energy saving measures. So that's why the production remained the same. Uh, but we got much less energy use. But yeah, you see that we lag behind then on the, uh, on the reference in, in that uh, case. So, yeah. In the first years, we were producing as much as the uh, as the reference case, um, and that was also because yeah, you have a higher uh, covering temperature, of course, in this uh, in this setup, and that enhances the uh, splitting of uh, of uh, of the trough development, and that gives you also the higher production in this uh, in this greenhouse. But it's well, it's good to see that with much less energy, you can uh, have the same production in the end. And that's uh, what you can see here. So here you see the heat use we had in these uh, several years. So here you see indeed that in this year we had even lower heat use. Uh, this is the uh, energy or the electricity consumption we had. And then, well, based on the conversion rate, you can uh, calculate what is then the total energy use. So you see that with 15 cubic meters of natural gas, where any reference is was 40, we could have the same production, so that's a, a very good uh, good result. So, 
So the conclusion of the three years is that it's very well possible to grow under a double gl uh, glassed uh, greenhouse with similar quality. Uh, the minimum pipe heating, which is often uh, used by growers, is not, uh, is not really needed. Um, we did not have any issues with botrytis or leaf burning, so the um, dehumidification system was working perfectly. So we had a very nicely spread, spread uh, climate, homogeneous climate in, inside the greenhouse. And well, the savings were more than uh, 40%. And uh, well, with the, green, the regain unit, uh, it saved uh, approximately 4 cubic meters of natural gas per square meter. And of course, you need an alternative for your CO2 apply. In um, Blijzak, we are connected to the OCAP system, so we get our CO2 from, uh, from Shell, basically. And that's, yeah, of course, quite useful because, uh, yeah, you, don't, you are not burning a lot of gas anymore because you are using so little that you need some alternative resources of CO2 if you want to apply CO2 enrichment. So that's something to consider when you are thinking of these systems. And there's another drawback, and that's snow. Because you have, when you have this double layer uh, covering material, normally with a conventional greenhouse, you just open the screen, turn on the heating, and then the snow melts off. But yeah, here we had to really uh, heat up the, the greenhouse in order to get, the, get rid of the snow. And then even it took a very long time before it, uh, it was gone. And it, of course, reduces your light transmissivity. Uh, and that's, also, of course, also an issue here in Norway where it also snows. Uh, more frequently even than in the Netherlands, I guess, then uh, yeah, this is something to consider if you are applying double glazing, that uh, snow is, uh, is a drawback of this, uh, of this system. Uh, well, then uh, the question was how can we even um, save more energy, yeah, so go below this uh, 15 uh, cubic meter of, uh, of uh, natural gas. Well, you can insulate even more, but that yeah, does not really uh, help a lot, we saw from, uh, from the calculations. Of course, you can uh, um, even lower your set points even more, um, <laughs> take care of the leakage even more, so make it even more airtight than what we already did. Um, um, yeah, with the dehumidification, with the regain, it's already at 80%, so it's very difficult to gain even more heat from this, uh, from this system. So the only way to really save more is to look into the transpiration of the crop, because uh, the crop transpires, of course, and that's why you have to turn on this regain unit or the dehumidification unit. So if you can reduce the crop transpiration, you can also save on energy. So that's what we are looking into uh, in, in this year. So if you look on a typical winter day, you see that, uh, well, this is the basically the transpiration on that, uh, on that day. And you see here, this is the heating demand. And, well, you can calculate, of course, the amount of transpiration. Uh, you can calculate how much uh, energy is being used in uh, a latent heat. And then you see, well, the basically this area is used for the transpiration of the crop of this, uh, this heating demand. So if you can reduce this or lower this line, you save, yeah, this line will also drop because you need less energy for, uh, for the transpiration. So that was the goal of the, of the new research. Um, and you see that, well, on this typical day, um, the energy use is approximately uh, uh, 0.21 cubic meters per square meter of the total. So that's, on that day, it's around 20% of your energy use. So if you look on a yearly base, yeah, the transpiration is quite low in this greenhouse also because there's, we already are growing at a higher uh, uh, relative humidity. But then the, uh, <coughs> if you calculate it, then the energy use for, uh, the, for uh, transpiration is about six cubic meters. So that's the energy you can save if you well, turn all the transpiration during the heating periods off. So that's the, uh, the potential uh, you have. So you see here, the graph over the years, so here there's quite some potential, and of course here there's not because this is all heat uh, by the sun, and then uh, well some uh, some uh, areas can be gained of course here as well. But the only way to reduce the t the transpiration is by increasing the humidity. So that's what we did in this uh, in this year. So here you see the humidity. So this was the previous year where we did not lower the humidity too much. Uh, or did not increase the humidity too much. And this is the new year where we, well, we are growing at a very high humidity. 
to save on uh, on the transpiration. Well, and what you can see it has a, a big effect because this was the uh, year 2013, the transpiration, and now we are on these two lines, and yeah, they, we are also applying different uh, um, uh, rock wall sizes, and that also gives a difference. <coughs> we are still looking into why that is, but it gives a difference, but at least you see that we have much less transpiration in this case uh, with the higher humidity compared to the uh, year 2013. Of course, it's not, it's not always really easy to compare because in 2013 you had less light or more light and the temperature was outside lower, but yeah, still you have to work with the year you have with the outside conditions, you can't change that. So. Uh, and then here you see the uh, energy use. So this was this is the uh, in what is uh, done in practice. This was in the 2013 year, and this is in the new year. You so you see, indeed, we are using much less energy compared to the previous year. But also, this year is warmer than the previous year, so some compensation has to be done for that. And then you see that the line comes around here. So not so optimistic as it's uh, it's now uh, being depicted. But still, it saves a lot on energy if you are. Uh, reducing the uh, transpiration rate of your of your crop. Um, yeah, and looking at the production, that's still the same. It's even slightly higher because we had some more light compared to uh, the previous year. So we are growing even more than uh, than the previous year. So there's no uh, issue on that. So the higher humidity does not um, cause any production losses or anything. So that's. Uh, that's good, and also in terms of disease, it's, it's still uh, it's still okay. Um, yeah, another thing is um, because the Venlo Energy greenhouse is quite expensive with this double uh, glass and well with all these coatings on it. So um, uh, consortium thought of a new greenhouse which was based on the same principles, but then on a, in a cheaper way, and that's this greenhouse, and it's now also being. Uh, Constructed or it's uh, constructed in Blijswijk, so this is an actual picture from it, and it has a, a glass and a plastic uh, covering, and a very a minimal uh, ventilation area, as you can see here. So it's it's also double, but then glass outside and then plastic uh, inside, and it's called the Too Safe Energy uh, Greenhouse, and that's now being tested, and it has a, a diffusing cover, uh, so the glass is diffusing and then an F-clean film below it. So you can see it here. So here's the outside uh, glass, and then here's the, uh, the film. And it has another uh, benefit, also for, uh, for Norway in this case, is that when there's snow, you can also circulate warm air through this area in between the glass and the plastic. So thereby warming up the glass and thereby melting off the snow. So that's a, a big benefit compared to the other uh, double layer uh, greenhouse where you were not able to do that. And here you can just place a ventilator here and then it blows air through this uh, chimney and then yeah, the, the glass warms up so the snow will melt off. So that's a, a big uh, benefit of that. And it of course has much lower cost compared to the uh, Venlo Energy. Well, then something about these uh, covering materials they are using. So here you see the yeah the most actual um, numbers on the basic materials. Eh? So you see, um, well, the best type is now uh, this one at the moment, <coughs> for all for hemispherical transmission. But if you want to have a very uh, high uh, uh, diffusion, then uh, well, the transpiration is slightly lower, of course, but it gains a lot on, uh, on your production if you uh, increase the uh, haze uh, number. So, but now these two are being used. So this one is used on the south side of the uh, greenhouse and this one is used on the northern side because the northern side of course has more diffusivity from itself because there's less direct solar radiation. So that's why they apply this with a slightly higher uh, transmission on the north side and then the other one on the, on the south side in order to uh, get some uh, uh, the maximum uh, amount of uh, diffusivity and the maximum amount of light inside the greenhouse. So I'm almost done uh, with my uh, with my talk. So well, 
it's always good to take home um, some messages from my uh, from the presentation I think so the, the main issues to be addressed is that well there's a big potential in energy saving just by insulation that's very well possible and humidity can and should be controlled under these greenhouses which are very well insulated so this new system where you use air ducts in order to distribute outside air that will be the the norm for the coming uh, for the coming years for all uh, greenhouses i uh, i think and uh, that's uh, something to consider and also well um, you saw the figures already from the production effect of applying diffusing glass on on the greenhouse it's tremendous so i think all new greenhouses and maybe even the old will be um, covered with uh, diffusing glass because uh, Tom yesterday told me that the payback time of diffusing glass is now only four years. So yeah, after four years you start to uh, to gain profits already from this uh, diffusing glass. So that will be really be the uh, uh, will, will be really be the future of uh, of uh, horticulture. So applying dehumidification in a controlled way and having a diffusing uh, covering material. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, for now. Thank you very much, Joke. It was a lot of information. <laughs> uh, and I must say, I'm a little bit or very much impressed about the results. Uh, I have to just explain some numbers here for the Norwegian audience. Because when you are talking about 40 cubic meters of gas, uh, that is. Uh, the same as 400 kilowatt hours per square meter. And if you go back to the old times when you had a standard consumption of energy for about 40 cubics uh, here in Norway, we are, we are talking about 450, 500, yeah. so because of the climate. But when he now is talking about 150 kilowatt hours per square meter, that's in fact one third of what we are using in Norway as a result of good experiments and uh, technical development. That's really impressive. So, um, but I guess um, the audience too have a lot of questions. So please, if there are anything you want to discuss now with Joke at the moment, or um, are there any now who want to ask something? Yes. I was wondering about this uh, this low emission uh, coating. Um, do you know the proportion of or how much energy saved because of that? Is it possible to calculate? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have the figures by heart, but it's yeah, it's not economical, by the way. <laughs> so it was done in this experiment, but if you calculate it, it's not economical because it really reduces also the uh, transmittance of the of the glass quite a lot. So. In that respect, it's uh, it's not economical, but it really reduces the yeah, from uh, normally it's about the emission is about uh, 0.86, <coughs> and now it's I think it's only 0.2 or something like that. So it really uh, reduces it a lot, but uh, mm -hmm. but it's not economical in the energy saving respect in relation to the uh, transmissivity of the uh, greenhouse. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask one more thing? Yes, yeah. And uh, in regards to this uh, this uh, diffusion glass, yeah, um, I know it's not your main area of. Yeah, but Tom can assist. Yeah. <laughs> Is there? Ah. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think it will be all as big in flower crops as in vegetable crops, or? Yeah. 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 yeah a lot of experiments now on roses have been done, and there also we see a lot of benefits. Yeah, and also because they're uh, leaf burning and. Well, all kinds of burning is even more an issue, mm. and then with diffuse it's less. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's also going to be uh, uh, applied there, and also in uh, in other crops like um, uh, Phalaenopsis, where also yeah you want to have more light in the greenhouse, but as you bring in more light, the chance of burning is is larger. But then with the diffusing, it's uh, it's less, of course. So uh, it will be applied there as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank Agree? you. Agree? Tom? Uh, yeah, a number of aquatic uh, uh, plants, uh, the appropriation sites, the short is quite a lot. Yeah. The big product and short is from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 
24, 26, 26 uh, week uh, cultivation period, down to 20 or sometimes even 16 in some uh, in some plants. Or, yeah, works. I should also guess that, for example, lettuce will be a, a profit on this, because in in the middle season we have a lot of trouble with the leaf burning. Mm. Uh, when the natural light comes and increases rather rapidly in March, we have uh, some troubles with the leaf burning. Yeah, yeah. yeah lettuce is often already cultivated under diffusing plastic, of course, so it's the same, uh, <coughs> the same principle there. Yeah. Yeah, you were then saying that in, in practice in the Netherlands, the um, most of the growers who were investing in some technology for the humidification used this uh, balanced ventilation system. Uh, when, the when balance, we were not really. It's, oh, it they isn't. are using the other system. So the balance is not... Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, it needs a lot of technology, so they prefer just to have the ventilator. And it's quite simple because you just have the gable and then you place in the ventilator and then directly the sleeve and that they offer FD three gutters yeah. or so. So it's quite easy to implement and well with the regain you need more the distribution system. So that's yeah. why they prefer the simple system. Yeah. yeah. Because when we were in uh, Wagningen uh, two years ago we heard about the new concept of semi-closed greenhouses and that was rather complicated. Yeah. Very complicated. True. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not being used a lot now because, yeah, indeed you need an aquifer, you need heat pumps, and you need all kinds of technology, so that's why it's not being used a lot. Uh, two questions. You are, one of the strategies, if I do understand you right, is increasing the air humidity. Could you then say a little bit more of how high and what influences you really are, what are your... Uh, thinking around it. Another thing is, if I understood you right, yeah. is you are not storing energy in any way, as we saw in the first lecture this morning. Is that uh, any situation where you think storing energy and reuse is actual? Thank you. Uh, well, concerning your first question, yeah, you can see it here. It's not really depicted as a relative humidity, but more as a vapor deficit. But well, in the past, especially in the beginning of the crop, you had a vapor deficit of around 10, and then it drops uh, to 6. And, but now we already are at, at a vapor deficit of uh, 3, so that's grams per cubic meter. And, yeah, well, you tend to keep it at that level for, well, the majority of the time. So that comes down to, I think, a relative humidity of 90, 90 95%, so very, uh, very high uh, relative humidity. And that gives you the effect of the... Uh, much lower uh, transpiration, which you can see here. So it, yeah, you really see a tremendous effect on your uh, on your on your transpiration. And that's this is during the periods of uh, of heating and in the night. Eh? So it's not not during the day because then you just yeah then the energy comes in basically for free. So you're not really concerned about the humidity levels then. So it's we only depict here the, the situations where we are applying heating when it's necessary to save on uh, on energy. Um, your second question was? Storing. Oh, yeah, the storing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because the storing <laughs> is difficult, the seasonal storing. So we had several projects all that also on seasonal buffering, just in a huge tank, very well insulated, but that did not work out uh, very well either. And then the seasonal buffering inside the aquifer. Yeah, an aquifer is quite expensive, and since the amount of heat you need is, is very limited, eh? since you only need now 15 cubic meters of, of heat, it's, it's very difficult to store that because there's always some flowing in these aquifers. So you put it in and then it flows away and then uh, it's gone. So that's also not, uh, not very helpful. And, but especially this whole insulation and then collecting the heat in the, in the summertime. And then it's, yeah, it's basically a bit of warm water. It's 16 degrees or 17 degrees. So it's not really like it's 40 degree water or something like that. So that's why it's it's difficult to store and that's why it's not being applied a lot uh, uh, in the in the new development yeah so the day to day you don't i think is yeah the day to day is that's that's still done of course but that's more to apply the co2 uh, so that you can burn the, the gas during the day apply the co2 to your greenhouse and then use the heat in the in the night and that will always be uh, be the case, although it's an issue, of course, when you are saving so much on energy that you are hardly burning any uh, 
any gas uh, uh, or any heat used during the night. So that's uh, that's an issue. So then you need an alternative resource of uh, of CO2, of course. Yeah. Uh, what about the practical growers? How many growers dare to grow tomatoes <laughs> at uh, 1.8 in uh, <laughs> water pressure deficit? Yeah, yeah, that's a challenge. Well, we are always doing these experiments with practical growers. So there's always a steering committee of, I think, four uh, practical growers, or <coughs> sometimes six even, who are guiding our experiments. So they see what we are doing. Well, they are not doing that at home, but they're doing that <laughs> in the experiment uh, with us. But yeah and they see that it's going okay without any diseases so yeah it's step by step they will also follow the approach but not directly of course because it's quite an, uh, a risk if they do it on a, a few hectares but uh, yeah the more they see that it's working they will also apply this technology but then step by step slowly increasing the humidity and then seeing if uh, everything goes well but and it of course has to do with properly insulating your greenhouse as well because if you're using the system even if you are using the dehumidification system but you're not properly insulating your greenhouse then still you will have temperature difference and then the chances of diseases at a certain location will be there so it's a it's a combination of the system and proper insulation in order to yeah allow these uh, high humidities to occur did you follow the diseases and quality of the crop or crops you were running in these experiments? Yeah. Can you say something about it or did it not? Be yeah, a there were no not uh, no diseases. Uh, also not in this year. Eh? No, no. So yeah, because it's so well insulated, and the yeah the humidification system works properly, bringing in the quite warm air, of course, because it's. With the regain units, that's uh, yeah, it's it's not an issue. The diseases at the moment. No, no, no. Shelf life is also being tested and things like that, but it's it has no influence on that. As well. uh, I think we had one year of cu cucumber as well there, but yeah, that yeah, but that was in 2012, I think. Yeah, so now we are running constantly with the tomato. Yeah. Uh, did you have any use of uh, fungicides during the crop time from January to October? I believe not. Eh? Do you know, Tom? Fungicides? Yeah, inside the greenhouse? Uh, we use Luna. Uh, it will last two years. Not, um, those were the types. That's the only, that's the only uh, uh, issue we have in the tomatoes. Okay. Heard it a little, a little uh, about uh, grow shimmer, a little bit about for bytrasis. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in um, uh, about five, six cubic meters of air exchange in the um, actively uh, forced air exchange system. That is uh, per square meter per day. Yeah. That you need to I change five to seven cubics. Per hour. It's, uh, it's what, it was per hour you needed yeah. to exchange. Yeah. I see if I have the number right. But it's per hour. Where is it? It's uh, per square me uh, per cubic meters per square meter per hour. So if you have a, a six meter tall greenhouse, then you need one air exchange per hour in order to. Uh, yeah. Get okay. The that yeah. makes more yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't read down there. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that um, dehumidification by salt systems. You mentioned briefly at the beginning that's yeah. an option. Can you yeah. say a little bit about a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, well, we had several tests now, and um, well, there was a new system there um, because, especially recuperating the salt, that's quite, that used to be quite uh, energy demanding because, yeah, you had to boil this soil, and then, but now they, they had a, a kind of system where uh, the salt was put into a kind of vacuum chamber, and then, yeah, you need much less energy, of course, to get the, uh, the water out of the salt again. So that worked well and also quite energy efficient. Although, yeah, always when you are dehumidifying, you will always 
provide heat, of course, uh, as the um, vapor is extracted from the air, it, the, the, the salt warms up and that uh, heat is directly released again to the, uh, to the air. So, yeah, you have to see if all the times you are dehumidifying, you also need a, a heating demand, otherwise yeah, you warm up the greenhouse and you lose some, uh, some heat there. But yeah, it worked well, but uh, um, yeah, especially all the technical apparatus you need in order to get it working, that's uh, quite a challenge, but it, it worked. So we used a kind of uh, pet system over which the uh, salt was, uh, was flowing, and through that the air was uh, pushed and then brought back into the, to the greenhouse again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> do you do any experiments in Holland on having greenhouses in cities? Small, uh, maybe smaller units, but in combination with, say, shopping malls or living apartments. Yeah. And you can then use the excess water and heating and make maybe excess water into grey water in buildings and so on. Do you do that in Holland, these the, experiments? There are, there are some projects in that field and... Also in Belgium, some projects are uh, there, but it's all in the conceptual phase still. Um, and yeah, there is some perspective, but then it's it's not an economic perspective. <laughs> it's a perspective more from a marketing issue point of view or uh, a social point of view. If if that's really relevant or that that gives the benefit to the, such a project, then it's that it's uh, yeah, then it can be can be done. Combining uh, grey water flows and heat from buildings with the greenhouse, that's usually quite difficult because when you are in need of heat for your building, you're, al you're also in need of heat of your greenhouse. So, the, yeah, it's not that if there's an excess of heat from your building, you can use it in the greenhouse or in storing. That's also quite difficult in the city. So, in terms of heat, there's not really any good exchange between the building and the uh, in the greenhouse, of course, grey water is a possibility, but um, it comes with a lot of health issues, of course, and you can't just use the grey water from a building and irrigate over your plants. You need the whole system to, to clean it properly so that uh, yeah, you, uh, the rules are, uh, are there. And then, yeah, if you all calculate it again, then economically it's better just to use tap water or, and then add nutrients uh, to it. So, um, yeah, the combination in that respect is also uh, it's possible, but it's it's difficult. So there should be some additional benefit, like indeed you want to close the loop, and that's a marketing uh, issue or a social issue again, and then you can do that. But that's from an economical point of view, it's it's not really worthwhile to uh, think of these uh, these concepts. But yeah, but a lot of initiatives are going on also in brussels i'm involved in a project on that to see for the delhaize and that's also a retailer uh, to see if they can they have a lot of area in brussels and they also want to utilize this area and place greenhouses on top of these uh, of supermarkets and uh, just for the production but then they also want to have a, a marketing concept so that the consumers can also get into this greenhouse and Maybe pick their own strawberries or lettuce or whatever, <laughs> and then yeah, that's that's then the benefit that people think it's uh, more healthy or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can you answer that? Yes. Um, you mentioned a payback time on four years on the diff diffuse glass. Yeah. Is that for? changing glass on an existing building or for a payback time on a, a new building, extra cost on a new building? New, eh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to the growing with a high humidity, yeah. um, I guess you then are using higher easy levels on uh, the watering? Uh, that was also applied, so that's what you saw with these uh, thick uh, uh, substrate layer and, and smaller. I, yeah, I saw it in the graph, there was a line there. But that's to regulate the... Um, what was it again? Yeah, I think it's here. So we use a, a smaller uh, substrate there in order to adjust the EC level during this low periods of, tra or when you want to have low transpiration, you want to in indeed increase the EC during that period also. 
and then during the day you want to decrease it again. So that's why we use a different uh, mat. But you see <laughs> that the bigger uh, substrate still gives le <laughs> less uh, transpiration than the uh, than the smaller one. Yeah. Okay. So so you tested with. Um Lower volume of uh, yeah, lower volume, volume of, of uh, substrate. Uh, substrate. Yeah, so you can in, on a hourly base change the EC of the uh, of the root system. Yeah, but it's yeah, I think it's how is it going? Not very, uh, not very successful yet. I think yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it's difficult. Because yeah, it still has a large volume, of course, and then you can't just yeah, you, then you have to flush or something. But that also gives a lot of problems. So. Uh, not easy to regulate the EC on an hourly base easily with big varieties of course then yeah okay uh, another thing um, on the different system you have presented here today solutions um, do you have any numbers on uh, cost what will what will the installation cost be per, per hectare or something for example on the different type of solutions yeah the, well the um the simple dehumidification system, eh, so that's uh, with the ventilator and in the in the in the side wall, and then just uh, the air ducts. That's yeah, for a big greenhouse, it's around eight to twelve euros per square meter, uh, approximately what they uh, charge for that. Um, yeah, then the regain unit that adds up, yeah, I think twenty four euros or something like that. So that's that's quite expensive because then you need much more distribution system and you need this regain unit itself and you need an additional ventilator so that's uh, that's more expensive uh, and the diffuse glass adds up to 12 euros at the moment 10 8 8 8 euros additional cost uh, for the covering and that's why this payback time of course also reduces a lot because the uh, the price is uh, is reduced a lot yeah, that's about the numbers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are uh, at the end. Thank you uh, once again, uh, Jokke, yeah. for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Um, Till uh, dere andre nå, så har du da forstått at her er det mange muligheter, mange ulike tekniske løsninger, så vi har ikke det ene riktige svaret, dessverre. Ja, det kommer vi helt sikkert ikke til å få heller. Så her gjelder det å tenke, prøve, men jeg synes vi i løpet av denne formiddagen her har fått en del tal på bordet som kan gjøre valget litt mer begrunnet i hvert fall, enn bare synsing. Og så får vi håpe at vi gjennom prosjektet og videre praktisk prøving kommer nærmere en konklusjon i forhold til en løsning på ulike type kulturer. Det er der jeg som rådgiver gjerne skulle komme, si at ja vel, i en agurkultur med så mye lys, så vi, velger vi den løsningen. Er vi i en patteplantekultur, eller kort, korttakskultur, så trenger vi en annen løsning. Vi er dessverre ikke der enda, men vi er på vei. Da er vi fem minutter for tida. Vi fortsetter i følge programmet, klokka fem på halv er det vel det står. Og da er det vel en strålende anledning til å sjekke ut av rommet for de som ikke har gjort det. Så da er vi tilbake klokka 10.25.